Testing. All right. Testing. All right. <laughs> What's that? Wait. Testing. Wait. All right. Oh, okay. I thought you were mocking my Testing. voice. All right. Yeah. How are you, Stan? I'm doing well. Me too. I'm excited. Me too. I'm excited about this podcast. I'm excited about life. Well, it's, uh, being excited about life is good too. Tell me why. What's exciting about life for you right now? <laughs> Lots of things. I got I got a great family. I have a great team of people work that I work with. I, I live in a great neighborhood. I have a great podcast co-host. Thank you. <laughs> Were we supposed to argue in this episode? I commit to arguing with Stan about whatever it is that we're going to answer. <laughs> no. I think we should start out with all the civility that we can muster. Okay. And then just <laughs> destroy. <laughs> no, you have a great podcast host, sure, but I have a better one. <laughs> You're right. <laughs> well, I'm glad uh, for those. Those are good things. Good oh, family, yeah. good crew, good neighborhood. Yeah. Having a podcast, you got it's like having a TV show yeah. it's a radio program or something. I mean, this is the kind of thing people didn't used to be able to have. I'm excited about going to work. You know, I do know it's work of choice. The work of choice, yeah. It's you know, it's why people listen to this podcast. Why is that? Because they want to do work of choice. Ah, yes. Usually, oh, I've got to be an artist. I got to be a musician. I got to go into the arts to make my living. That is not the way it happens. No, it's <laughs> I want to do this. Yeah. And if I can make my money doing it, oh, what a great way to live a life. So, yeah. Sure is. Living the dream. Welcome to the Draftsman Podcast, everybody. Hi. Hi, Marshall. I'm welcoming you as well. Well, <laughs> thank you, yeah. Stan. Welcome to our homes. Uh, Marshall's background is a lot nicer than mine. I have a crib in the background. That speaks of life. It's true. Welcome to the Draftsman Podcast. My name is Stan, and this is... Marshall Vandruff. And we're going to do another voicemail question. We are. Because we got so many of them in the backlog. Yeah. And we did a full series of n recreating art school where we didn't do any voicemails, and now we're compensating. And we felt guilty about it. I we mean, did. we felt like not having you have a voice in any of those first four art school recreation videos yeah. was not fair. Yeah. So, we're making up for it. This is like the, the whole truckload of responding to you. Yeah. Well, Marshall, has anything happened since five minutes ago when we recorded the previous episode? Yeah. I'm <laughs> drinking real coffee. This is not typical for me. This is one of the strongest cups of coffee ever made by a human being. <laughs> I want to see what happens. Dang. I mean, last season we did a, we did a podcast about drugs. This we is the did, season where Marshall we? actually experiments with drugs in front of the camera. I want to see what comes of it. Wait, you drink coffee in almost every episode. What do you mean? No, no, no. It's every every three or four episodes I drink coffee. Really? But never one this strong. I thought that no, Sean or Katie always made you a cup of coffee towards they the- They do. They make oh, me a cup but of it's coffee always in usually the in the second or third episode in a day. Yeah. This is the second episode of the day. That's true. And Katie and Sean never would have dared to make a cup this- this strong. Robust. Really? I don't know whether, yeah, you might not be able to see it, but just in case you can, I want you to see. It's it's a cup of tar. Well, are you showing me or the audience? Oh, that's right. You can't I'm see it. I'm in the, com let the me, computer. Well, I'm yeah. afraid if I try to show it to you, it might spill. Oh, I see. It's on... black. It's, it's yeah, pure yeah, it's black. black. Oh, yes. <laughs> not one of those wimpy put creamer or half and half or that. Blonde, is that what they call it? Coffee mate stuff in it. No, this is the real thing. That's, that's interesting stuff. <laughs> <laughs> All right. I'm already having fun. I know this is going to be a good podcast. Good. Do we just need to speak of coffee to make you have fun? Yeah. I feel yeah, like yeah, that's, anytime we that's talk of coffee, you're just the, the, the talking about it, not even drinking it, but just talking about it gets your energy level up. It does. It's because it's a rare occasion. Yeah. Yeah, it's like when Melissa was having her twenty first birthday, and she was she was drinking way too much, and I just started pouring her like apple juice or something, <laughs> and she was like, "Oh yeah, 
<laughs> anything works as long yeah. as it reminds me of the real thing. Yeah. yeah. And then sometimes, have you ever been with someone um, who's he like they take their first sip of their cocktail or whatever, mm-hmm. and they're already like, "Oh man, I'm feeling it." <laughs> it's like, no, you're not. It's in your head. You can't possibly be feeling it from the first sip. This helps us respond to our people who call in with emotional things, is that it isn't necessarily the drink. It's the Placebo. anticipation of it. It's yeah. the emotion that goes along with it, that your body just starts shooting out endorphins immediately. Yeah, it's like, oh, the energy's and- coming. So I'm just going to start using up my reserves now because I know it's coming. And I don't think that we should hesitate another moment, that we should get right into these voicemails <laughs> on right. the Draftsman podcast. All right, Marshall. Are you ready? I'm ready. Hi, Sin and Marshall. Thank you so much for always making this amazing podcast. I'm really enjoying listening to it so far. Um, my name is Rebecca, and my art question for you is, I have a problem where I often don't notice errors on in a piece I'm working on until it's mostly finished. Um, and then it's kind of a struggle to see the piece all the way to the end. So I was wondering if you had any tips to train yourself to see problems in a piece sooner, um, things like anatomy and perspective. Um, and then my second question is, if you notice those problems late um, and your goal is to learn as much as you can, do you think it's best to just finish your piece and uh, try again later? Uh, maybe to try and course correct your piece halfway through, or is it better to just redraw from scratch? Um, maybe different solutions are better in different situations, but I'd like to hear your thoughts. Thanks again. Bye. Can I start this one? Yeah. In 1985 at that Drew Struzan workshop, when one of the students showed, it wasn't a student, it was a professional illustrator who showed his work, Drew looked at it and immediately said, do you have astigmatism? And the artist said, yes, I do. And Drew was able to see right away that there was a discrepancy Maybe, I, I don't know how stigmatism works, but the discrepancy in the left-right relationships. So there's the first thing that I would think is, is there a, an uh, objective issue going on of vision? But even if there isn't, I don't think I have astigmatism, but I always had symmetry problems of the left and right not looking correct. Uh, and people showed me, if you just look at it in a mirror, now when you're in Photoshop, you flip it back and forth and make the comparisons. That can help a lot. Stan, do you have anything to say about the things looking off? It depends on what's looking off. Some people, even with an untrained eye, can see that things are off. Like, especially in a portrait. You can see when eyes are not, you know, pointing in different directions. Just even the subtle amount. Uh, any, Any person who interacts with other people is trained to see a face and be able to judge emotion um, and where people are looking. Um, So, those kinds of things you can trust yourself on. Um, Other things that requires more training, you'll just, you'll develop that eye as you draw more. You'll develop a sensitivity for being able to tell, uh, to judge foreshortening, um, proportion, you know, proportional issues that of things you don't usually see. Uh, you know, like Kim jong Gi talks about how like, you know, people ask him, how do you, how are you able to draw things like a, a, a coffee shop from an aerial point of view from someone on the ceiling if you've never observed that before? And he's, he talks about how like, he has seen people from t- uh, above, you know, he, he, he knows what that looks like because he's always observing. So, when he's in a library and he's on the second story, he looks down and he just he just stares and observes what people look like from that angle. And then he can use those patterns to draw a coffee shop from above, you know, and he, he knows how to draw a chair or a table from any angle. It doesn't really matter. And that just comes from experience of observation and, and developing that mental visual library. Yeah. The issue of whether you should carry through with it, Rebecca, has... It's, it's impossible to say without knowing more, but having a second eye certainly helps. That thing of flipping things back and forth or looking at them in a mirror or looking at them upside down is a way to give yourself a fresh view. But if you've actually got someone in the room with you, someone that you can have them look at it and say, yeah, look, something's wrong, uh, that can help you correct in route. 
And whether you should carry it to finish? I don't know. That depends on you. Pixar has this wonderful set of 22 maxims. Actually, it was a woman who worked there and she tried to take the story wisdom of the Pixar story people and turn it into 22 maxims. And one of them is to go ahead and finish, even if it isn't as good as it can be. Next one can be better. That is sometimes important to a person who never reaches closure. But if you are reaching closure pretty regularly, then no, you would need the opposite advice. You would need to say, I need checkpoints. I need milestones. You've gone one mile, it's a 20 mile journey. We've gone one mile, let's check and make sure you're not getting into a deep hole here. Let's make sure you're not creating a link in the chain that is so weak that the whole chain breaks. And that will cover for that. One of the checkpoints, one of the things on your critique list is, are my proportions correct? Are my lefts and rights? Is my symmetry and perspective? Very important one. I don't know in responding to your work by seeing what the issues are, but a very common one is X lines. That's width lines that go through the corner of each eye, the corner of the base of the nostril, the corner of the ears, the corner of the canines, because those are non-negotiable horizontal lines that will be lined up on a face or any symmetrical animal. So when you put it into three-quarter space, to be able to track those and know that they're all heading off in the same direction, maybe even to a vanishing point, that will help you keep the symmetry in perspective. So that's a guess, but I want to say one more thing. Stan mentioned that portraits, uh, it's particularly sensitive because we're so aware of faces from the time we're born. It's one reason why there's more forgiveness in drawing animals. People don't know animal anatomy as well as they know human anatomy. And so if something's a little off, it's more forgivable. But the arena where you are most able to get away with this is to choose trees because trees <laughs> or rocks <laughs> or rocks, they're so subjective. So if you can't solve the problem, you can always just say, I'll do trees and rocks and I'll make them really interesting. But this uh, is something that you've you obviously got an issue that you've got to deal with. Yeah. And you're going to have to deal that with that probably where you've got a mentor or a, a teacher giving you immediate feedback or regular feedback on your work in process. Yeah. As far as carrying through with it, um, it I think that it, it is a case by case basis where it's like, how how much of a mistake did I make? Do I have to erase most of this? Will I destroy the paper in the process? Um, how far have I gone already? Did I put 20 hours into it and I'm almost done and I just have to fix, you know, the shading on, on one shoulder because it's off? Or do I have to redo the gesture? It's like if your gesture is off and you've already put, you know, you're almost done. Yeah, start over. <laughs> Yeah. You're not going to fix the gesture. So, it depends on the problem. And like you said, Marshall, it also depends on the person. If someone has a tendency to not finish projects, things that they start, that's a really bad habit. And I would, in any case, just try to follow through and finish it, even if they think that it's not worth it, just to develop the habit of finishing things. Yes. So... As with almost every question, it depends. <laughs> That's right. So, not enough data. Not available. enough data. Yeah. Who are you? Rebecca, I understand the feeling. Having had terrible proportions uh, for so much of my attempts at drawing and feeling like, how come I can't get these? I figure, is it just a talent? Had a colleague who, when she was 18, she hit proportions so exactly without any effort, she would do a gestural line and it would just land. It's like, how did you learn to do this? And she didn't learn to do it. She just had something in her that she could see proportions and match proportions and get things right and always made it look right. But for those of us who don't have that, it means taking time to work on it. And you have at least done something very valuable. You've named the problem. You're not hiding behind anything. You're saying, look, I got this problem. And so that means there's going to be some solutions to it. Yeah. Can you hear 
Cooper crying in the background? No, I can't. Okay. But as sorry as I am for Cooper, uh, it I kind of miss the sound uh, of a kid crying, oh just not too often. Yeah. I feel bad for him. I wonder what happened. Okay, Stan, should we rate how we did with those uh, that, that answer? Should we grade each other so that we've got something to uh, a little contest here? I want to get back in the ring. <laughs> okay, well, maybe we'll argue more. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I think we will. I think you did a really good job. I, I liked your oh, answer. Oh, thank you. Well, I caught a piggy what grade would you give me? Piggy backed off yours, so. So that means I need to give you something like a C or a D if we're really going to turn this into anything, or should we do the competitive? No, yours was an A also. Whatever you want. This whole thing was your idea. It was. <laughs> but if you're not going to fight. I mean, I'm not going <laughs> to just be mean just to be mean. You're right. <laughs> you're, you, you are not mean just to be mean. My priorities are to Rebecca. And I was just trying to give her a good answer. <laughs> hey, so were mine. Doesn't seem like it. <laughs> oh, yeah, your opinion. <laughs> Which is more important than yours. Yeah, in your opinion. <laughs> Again. Gosh, we suck at this. <laughs> this is going to, I think what we bad. need to do is what, I think what we need to do is what Rebecca needed to do. We need to spend some time away from the camera, learning to insult each other. Or we could get one of those books. It's a collection of insults. I used to have a book called A Thousand and One Insults. I may still have it buried under piles of books somewhere. We'll pull it out. See if we can revive the art of the classic insult. Uh, maybe not. Maybe that's a waste of time, Marshall. Next one. Let's do it. Hi, Dressman. I'm a 28-year-old student currently attending a community college for an associate degree in animation, and I'm almost done. It was great to get my generals done and get introduced to a bunch of concepts there, but... I feel like I've kind of broke through the glass ceiling of the curriculum. I also haven't had time to work on personal projects because of school. I'm tempted to apply for art schools and continue my education, but the huge financial burden of tuition is scary. A lot of my professors and counselors are pushing me towards an internship instead of art school. I'm also leaning heavily towards doing concept art instead. But every time I bring it up to a school employee, they try to push me towards illustration classes at the community college. My question is, should I take what I've learned and build a portfolio to get an internship or finish my BA somewhere to further improve my chances of success? Thanks. Bye. Stan has the answer, and it's it depends. <laughs> Damn it, Marshall. Of course it depends. But, I mean, if I had to pick an answer, I would say go for that internship. You're going to learn a lot more from it than from your illustration class. Gosh, that's hard to argue with. If you've got an opportunity for an internship, don't turn it down. Or do what William Stout talked about in one of my Asking Pros videos where he got college credit for doing professional work. I don't know if your school will do that, uh, but look into it. Maybe your school does. But if it doesn't, I would lean towards doing the professional work. Yeah, if you've got classes there that you haven't taken, you said you reached that glass ceiling. If you've got classes you haven't taken and that you wish you could take them because they're going to help you, you can fill in those gaps. But there comes a point where school just isn't likely to help you as much as a whole other set of lessons, which is the real world yeah. of commerce and clients and deadlines and all of that. And... You hear it many times from people who went right into the profession. Sometimes, often enough, they do wish they had taken some time in school to learn a few things that are the luxury of spreading out that learning. But for the most part, they just learn faster. Or you'll learn that you don't even want to do this. <laughs> like you did, right? Yeah, exactly. With my internship. It's, I mean, I learned I learned things, obviously, for, about the, the industry and stuff. But I, the main thing I learned is just that I, I want to pivot and go in a different direction. Okay, community college student, unnamed. <laughs> You're asking this question before we did the how to create your own art education. And there's going to be quite a bit in those eight episodes that may be useful to you. So check them out and see if it helps with your question. Hello, I'm Nacho and I'm 19. I'm from Spain and I have been following artists for a few years now. Uh, the thing is that most of them, even in this podcast, 
say that in order to be an artist, you need to dedicate your whole life to art. Even Stan uh, said once that you don't need to care about social relationships until you are a stable professional. So my question is, is it really necessary to give everything up in order to have an artistic career? Is that even worthy? I mean, I mean don't get me wrong, uh, I really want to do animation and I work on my skills, but I don't want to pull my friends away from me just because I need to work 25 hours a day to improve and to get like, to be successful. I don't think that's even human. You want to give a quick answer? I think so. I mean, because this is kind of a follow-up question to, uh, I think, an answer we gave someone else before. Yes. I think that, no, I think everybody's going to have, it depends. <laughs> It depends. It depends on you. No, everyone learns in their own, at their own pace. Everyone has different amounts of skills that they're going to have to work on in order to become the artist that they become. Um, and also, you know, that one lecture um, by Neil Gaiman, you know, you only need three of those things, right? You either need to be really good, you have to be easy to work with, or you have to turn your stuff in on time. You need two of those things. Yeah, you need two of the three. So, you know, you could just suck at what you do and you could still turn your stuff in on time and be a, a pleasure to work with. And, and you, you know, you can have a decent career, I think. Yeah. yeah. I've seen it happen. Yeah, exactly. So, so no, the, the, the quick answer is no, you don't have to give up your social life. If that's really important to you, then you're going to be miserable trying to avoid that. So, no, don't do it. But you do have to also keep keep in mind that anybody else who is is putting in 25 hours per day is going to improve faster than you at those things that they're putting in their time. So, in order for you to kind of catch up, you might you either have to practice smarter than they are, um, make better decisions, you know, you know, don't waste time practicing things that aren't going to be beneficial to you. Um, and maybe because you are happier in, in general, because you have a better social life, you are capable of making better, smarter decisions. You know, there is always that balance. Um, you just have to know your strengths in this game. And it is kind of a game. Emotion affects it. Yeah. And so, yeah, social life is important. But I think that there's something in mythic story structure called threshold guardians, that when a character sets out to do the thing they're going to do in this story, there are going to be demons that come out of the woodwork and say, no, you will not do that. They wouldn't bother you if you just go on with life as usual, but trying to change things, you're going to have unseen enemies become visible and tangible. And one of those for going into the arts is that this is going to be a lot harder work than you thought. This is not something where you just pick up your brushes and create. This is going to take years of dedication. That's something that everybody needs to face early on, but it isn't the only part of the story. And the other thing is that the, jo the work can be enjoyable and you can have a great social life. You can even have kids. Yeah, we we had a podcast on having kids. <laughs> we both had kids. Yeah. And that takes way more time than friends. Oh, yeah. So, if he's not talking about starting a family, if he's talking about hanging out with his friends, geez, yeah, you can. You check and see how you feel when you hang out with your friends and you check whether they, they bolster your energy or whether they sap your energy. Big difference. Yeah, he might not have to cut out the social part of his life, but he might have to cut out other things of his life that are not growing as an artist and his social life. You know, there's so many other things you do on a daily basis that you can cut out or improve, be a little more efficient at, like exercise. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Don't do that. <laughs> but that tends to be the thing. But that's such a bad idea. Hey, I got a personal question for you, Stan Prokopenko. Oh, right. I love talking about me. How you doing with the uh, the exercise thing? How you doing with keeping in shape? Well, d d you know how I, t I was talking about us, how I'm going to the YMCA every day now? Yeah. And just as that happened, I can't go to the YMCA anymore, obviously, right? It's closed. Yeah, of course, it's closed. All gyms are closed. So, I mean, uh, that habit is gone. Oh, that's right. So, you got an excuse now. But I want to. That's the good thing is like, I, I'm like, ah, I want to go, but I can't. 
So that means the habit was starting to get formed and there was very little friction. You're keeping in shape then? Not as much because I'm not going to the gym, but I am doing something daily. Um, okay. At least an hour and a half walk outside. Hour and a half walk a day? At least, yeah. That's good. Okay. But I definitely need to do more strength training because yeah. walking isn't enough. Cooper's at an age though where you can throw him up in the air and catch him a whole bunch of times. Moms love to see that happen. <laughs> yeah. And, and kids love it too. Kids love it. So, yeah. Family time and exercise. Yeah. Sorry to have changed the subject. I just, just wanted to inquire how you were doing. I'm doing all right. Not as good as it was before the stay at home thing. Yeah. But that's that's uh, that's my bad. I, I didn't try to replace my previous habit with an, a new one in my in the new circumstances. Right. That's right. I, I should have created a new habit of some of working out here, which I don't have any equipment. So I should have just bought some or something, you know. Or figured out, figured out what to do. Yeah. Arnold Schwarzenegger, I think, has a guide to working out without equipment or something. And he did that like a long time ago? He posted it on Reddit um, recently, like when the stay-at-home thing happened. Oh, okay. Of how to work out on your own. Yeah, but it's using clips from his from when he was young, like video clips. Yeah, and, yeah I, think, I think he repurposed something else, but okay. either way, it's Arnold Schwarzenegger showing you how to work out at home without equipment. Okay, I'm, I'm expecting next time we do podcast to see some muscles. Okay. Oh, you know what? Charlie is doing a P90X and he said he just, I think he finished the first one and he's on like the second, um, he's doing it a second time or something. And what is it called? C90X? P90X. What is that? Oh, you never heard of it. No, tell me. It's a video uh, program for working out. So, next time we see Charlie, he should have muscles. I mean, Charlie could just take a picture of himself without a shirt on and cut to it. I think we should. Yeah. I think just we need, we need to break this up a little. <laughs> Too much Stan and Marshall. We need to have the other draftsmen in here. <laughs> Girls, get ready. <laughs> here comes Charlie. <laughs> and no flexing and no oiling yourself. The, yeah. It's got to be tone, not amping it up. Yeah. Okay, let's move on. <laughs> Just, oh, God. I'm really curious if he's actually going to do this. <laughs> uh, I think Charlie has a brave streak in him. I think he's the understated member of the Draftsman podcast. The guy who's behind the scenes. Charlie is important in my life. Yeah. He is He is like a surgeon uh -huh. in that he cuts out malignancies. <sighs> and he is like a therapist. In that regularly when we edit these things and I say, oh, gosh, that was just a terrible podcast. He says, Marshall, it wasn't as bad as you think it is, but there were some problems with it. And so, yeah, Charlie is important in my life. So, he should have his moment yeah. in the sun. One of my favorite things you've said is that amputations save lives. <laughs> you're you're yeah. referring to cutting things out of podcasts saves episodes. <laughs> yeah, or at least it saves tedium. It saves boring people. I mean, the, can you imagine you, how how much stuff hits the hits the floor? And as Mike Nichols said about editing, once it hits the floor, it dies. It completely withers up. You never miss it. It never wants to come back. But back to our podcast. This episode is brought to you by the Proco Figure Drawing Fundamentals Course. Learn the core concepts of drawing through the tradition of figure drawing, a process that will allow you to draw dynamic and three-dimensional people in any position and light them from any angle. This is a course that will walk you through the whole process, from drawing the gesture and motion of the pose all the way to shading the forms. You'll explore how to simplify the torso into the bean and robo bean, how to mannequinize the anatomical forms, and how to identify important landmarks on the body. You'll also learn how to measure proportions, exaggerate the pose, and keep your figures balanced. Each lesson includes assignments and example demonstrations, which serve as answers for the assignments. I've even included critique videos with real student assignments, so you can learn from their mistakes. So if you're interested in learning how to draw the human figure, and don't want your drawings to look like this, go to progo.com slash figure. I've packed it with lessons and laughs so you can have fun while learning serious drawing skills. Okay, back to the podcast. 
All right, let's play the next one. Good morning, Stan and Marshall. Thank you for the great podcast. My question is about life drawing. I experience that it is nearly impossible to find studios or classes that offer open studio life drawing using gestural poses. Started my own group, but could only get attendance if I had the model sit for long sessions. I lived in Rome for a year, even there nothing, and I live in Asheville, North Carolina. Plenty of open studios, none with quick poses. In most cases, the attending artists don't necessarily know anatomy enough to not need it is they always seem to want to render their lack of uh, anatomical knowledge with rendering over their mistakes in the drawing. I draw plenty from photos, but would prefer a live models. Do you know of any workshops, conventions, or something else that is available? Thank you, Dan Colonna. It depends. This may be a marketing and leadership question more than it is an art question. I mean, we've got what I understand is that you've got people who want long poses and lots of rendering, and you'd like to emphasize other things. And your your clients, your people who would attend these life drawing sessions, are not in sync with what you would like them to be. Is did I understand that correctly, Stan? I think so. So he he wants shorter pose, quick sketch, right? Yeah. You know that's interesting because I've I've seen the opposite. From from workshops I've attended, most most of them do more quick poses because it's they're filled with beginners who run out of things to draw after 20 minutes. Yeah. And so they do quicker poses. And so so I I've actually it's been rare for me to find a workshop that has a three hour pose. But I, I think it's impossible for us to answer this question because it, it's like, it depends on where you live. Like every every town, every city is going to have a different person organizing these workshops. They have different schools, different colleges that have work uh, model sessions. So, I, I'm sorry, I can't, I don't know every, you know, <laughs> every life drawing workshop around. Yeah, this this is not an art issue so much it is is a social issue. Yeah. And and I don't know whether you're inclined to take on the challenge and say watch me go into this desert and turn it into an oasis. Watch me take this ragtag bunch of kids and turn them into the Cracker Jack baseball team. I don't know how to tell you to do that. I can yeah. think of a movie called Baghdad Cafe that is one of those traveling angel movies where you take uh, an environment that isn't working and you've got one person's personality who turns the environment away. Mary Poppins does that too. I mean, you really are electing yourself to be in a position where you are transforming people's interests as opposed to just conducting a, a life drawing session. Uh, that's the best I can do is to just point at what this issue is. It's not really an art concern so much as my friends aren't interested in watching the same kind of movies as me. What do I do? Yeah. Get, get them interested or find other friends if you can. Yeah. Cool. Great job, Marshall. Your answer was better than mine. Thanks, Stan. You did pretty well yourself there. Thank you. Okay, well, maybe we'll argue more. I don't think so. <laughs> yeah, I think we will. Yeah, you know, I always thought of you as a good arguer. I've observed you as a pretty good arguer. <laughs> Thank you. And then now to see you just throw compliments out, when someone sets them up, I'm setting myself up to be socked in the jaw, and I'm getting, oh, that's pretty good, Marshall. I don't know. You're coming off as kind of a wimp, Stan. Well, maybe it's my argue, argumentative nature that makes me just do the opposite of what I'm supposed to do. Oh, so when somebody attacks, you just go limp and say, oh, why are you, why are you hitting me? And you, You're not attacking me either. I'm, I'm attacking you right now and how wimpy you are at starting an argument with me. I thought you were the champ. Oh. Here I am. Hit me. Hit me. Okay. Boom. Uh, how's that, Marshall? <laughs> okay. Come on. Stand here. Okay. Uh, uh, boom. Come on, man. <laughs> So stupid, Marshall. What the hell? I was just going to move on to the next voicemail. Yeah, let's go to the next next section. Hi, Marshall and Stan. Uh, first of all, uh, this is Crystal. I just want to tell you that I love your podcast. I'm kind of losing my voice, but I really wanted to ask this question. Um, 
your podcast has been kind of a lifeline, especially the one recently about artists with kids. I have two of my own. Uh, I recently went back to college to finish my degree in art education to teach middle school and high school. I've um, been studying art again for a couple of years, but about five months ago, my husband passed away uh, unexpectedly and kind of realized that, you know, my time is not really guaranteed. So if I'm going to do this, I'm going to do it now. Um, I kind of want to set an example for my girls, too. I work mostly in acrylic and watercolor. Uh, I really wanted to improve my drawing skills, though, so I started online with Watts. But my question really is relating to artists that might have issues with injuries or things like carpal tunnel. Um, I'm finding that the longer that I draw, I can only hold the pencil for about five or ten minutes. My hand is burning and numb. And, of course, the doctor can only tell me what they can do as far as repairing it. But uh, what I was wondering was if you knew any artists or um, have any experience with people having surgery or repair on something like that, uh, bouncing back from from those treatments, um, recovering from that, how maybe how, how you recover your dexterity that you've worked on or just from an artist's perspective, bouncing back from that. Um, any any advice would be greatly appreciated. Thank you. Do you want me to start with this one? Sure. This might be one where it's worth bringing in an expert who knows it from physical therapy experience. You ask, do I know people? Do we know people who bounced back? Yes. I am one. I had serious issues with this uh, hand, especially what happened to my thumb one night when I made a lot of money uh, holding an airbrush in tight tension all the way through the night to meet a morning deadline. And the the injury was tangible for 15 years. And other issues too, gripping the pencil too tight. Uh, and I'm functional now from having stopped doing those things. And I know a number of people. We had a, had maybe 10 years of everybody who's got issues of carpal tunnel and other repetitive stress injuries dealing with it. Uh, surgeries tend to be bad news because they tend to take care of the, the symptom rather than the problem, in my opinion. That's one thing I observed about it. And the main thing I'm told with itises and algas is that the way you deal with them is you stop doing the thing that is creating the pain and let it heal and learn to do it in balance. Uh, an expert can tell you more about when to use ice, when to use heat, uh, other options, but that's the shortest version I can give you. And the most important thing is, yes, people do bounce back from it, but it does mean that you've got to ease up for a long period of time on what it is that's creating the problem in the first place. Yeah. What's your experience with it, Stan? Um, I haven't had hand issues because I've never gripped my pen <clears throat> pencil very hard. I just let it kind of dangle in my hand great but i have back problems because i sit too much right it's, it's that's a repetitive thing too you sit too much and you have problems in your torso <laughs> which i think is worse than your hand my solution to that has been to sit less <laughs> like you said <laughs> you do that thing <laughs> less um and it whenever i do that it helps um but i have i've never gotten to the point where i've had to have surgery so I personally don't have, I guess, as much experience with it as, as some other people. Um, but of course, there's people that bounce back. There's people in the Olympics who are uh, sprinters who are missing a leg. I didn't know about that. Yeah, he's an Olympic sprinter. A sprinter who's missing a leg? Yeah. <laughs> that well, sounds... that must be a sight to see. Yeah, well, he has a, a fake leg. Okay. But yeah, it's amazing. I mean, he's one of the, like, the top, what is it, 15? How many people are on the track at the same time wow. 10 in the hmm. world and he doesn't even have a real leg so of course like you can <laughs> it's just but it, like you you obviously have a disadvantage hey guys future stan here i just found out that oscar victorious the olympian that i mentioned ended up killing his girlfriend so screw that guy and you've got the added issue of that you have had personal crises 
and emotional stress and other things that if this is adding to it, uh, you don't want your art under these circumstances to be making it worse. Uh, boy, this is a tough one. I, I, I don't know that we are qualified to offer that much. Yeah, I guess the only thing I'd say is like, is stay positive. Positivity is going to help in um, <laughs> in all of these kinds of problems. Listen to your doctors and then do your own research online. There's so much information out there about how you can improve your your own health. Um, do do study up as much as you can on it and and try to do everything you can to fix it. Be smart about it. Don't push yourself too hard. Take breaks. Um, again, we're not doctors, but you can find information elsewhere. Well, if this is of any comfort, I've observed a good deal of middle age is adjusting <laughs> to accommodate these things. <laughs> that this one person gets an allergy to turpentines and they love painting with oils, and so now they move to acrylics. Uh, another person finds that putting their hands... I found that because I wrote in tiny four-point type and gripped a 0.3 pencil and wrote thousands of, I mean, many, many hundreds of pages in my journal, that that was so hard on these muscles and these tendons that I switched to the word processor in the 90s and it was a different area of the hands that were being affected by it. So it relieved the... The problem of gripping a pencil like this, now you got the problem of your hands being like this. The next thing is we've got to get the problem of the hands not freezing in that position. But that's just the reality of anything we do a lot of. It's going to have to be compensated for, balanced out, and muscles that do the opposite work have to be strengthened, stretched and strengthened. Yeah. Uh, you have a an employee who was my student from the time she was a teenager, who is now a professional massage therapist, who knows a lot about this stuff. And even just over, over the phone has given me wisdom about, you know, how the when the thumb gets pushed into a position like this from curling up on the mouse and spending so much time on the keyboard. She said, we got a great one for that. And it's to turn your hand into supination and extend your little finger while you are pulling out on the thumb like that. And it hurts in the thenar eminence of your thumb. That is this part of the thumb. It hurts, but that's a great one for compensating, working with a trackpad for too long. So you're just stretching these muscles here. Stretching. That's, that's yeah, what the, the purpose of that is? Yeah. It's stretching out the opponent's polysis and the other group, that group there in there in the base of the thumb. Okay. Well, I, I don't know how much we helped you. Yeah. But yeah. I hope, I hope good things for you. Yeah. Good luck. Here's another one. Hi, my name is David from Norfolk, Virginia. I was wondering if you were planning on ever doing any videos on composition. Or do you have any recommendations for resources, either online or books, that would help learn about that? Thank you. Well, that's a very quick answer. Yes, eventually we will. In fact, I think, Marshall, you want to do a composition course, but you're still on your, what is it, eighth year of perspective now? Seventh, Seventh year. year of perspective. So, so we'll see when that happens. But do you have any recommendations for books we could answer this in like a few seconds and then move on to the next one yeah go to my website and i make some recommendations of books on the page on composition martialart.com the recommendations section on composition but we're going to do a podcast on it too how to study composition oh that's true yeah. we are going to do that yeah that is another. that's the plan um, hi, my name is Cindy, and my question is regarding the book uh, Natural Way to Draw by Nicolaides. Um, ever since Marshall mentioned this in the earlier episode, I feel really strongly this is something I need to go through in order to build a solid foundation to develop my artistic skills. But the difficulty I have is that I don't know how to go about it, and I really need your advice. Um, I know I can just take the schedules laid out in each chapter and follow it, uh, my full-time job has nothing to do with art, but I can definitely carve out one hour per day for the practice. 
The problem I have is that Nicolaitis curriculum seems to call for a lot of life models and cast models, and none of these I have access to. I really want to keep my materials simple and focus on the drawing and not the tools. But um, do I just start drawing and hope for the best? So, Marshall, I was wondering how you would have structured the course if you had to make one of those uh, based on Nicolaitis' book. And also, I also have a stance course on figure drawing, so I intend to incorporate that, too, in the practice. Um, thank you for considering my question. Bye. Yeah, my advice is just drop Nicolaitis and keep going with my course. I'm just, I'm just kidding. I'm just joking. No, this is all yours, Marshall. You, you, I, I've never gone through Nicolaitis, so I can't. If you don't have access to a live model, here's what you can do. Here's what I have students do. You collect in a folder what I call the folder bodies worth knowing. Athletes, surfers, pole vaulters, basketball players, even people that are in full uniform like football players where you hardly see the body parts. But athletes is one thing. Bodies that are worth studying, particularly when they're in motion or they're dealing with some kind of forces, but they could just be people posing in a life drawing course, uh, in, in a life drawing room. Um, that way, you've got a collection of photographs to work from. Now, people will tell you, it's not the same working from photographs. And they're right. But is it really that big a deal? Can you not deduce from photographs what you need? Nicolaides makes a point in there that you can study the gesture of drapery as it is being suspended, as it falls into inert folds, as it's on somebody's body and it's one way or another, depending on the position of their limb, everything, is, according to Nicolaides, has gesture. So you make a collection of things that you're interested in and try to use those exercises to understand their dynamics, the way they change and move. And that makes it more fun. Now, that's one, one answer to one of your questions. You do not need to study Nicolaides. The most interesting phenomenon when you bring up a book, that there's something about is he pro-Nicolaides or anti-Nicolaides? He's both. That is so difficult to deal with. How can you be both? Nicolaides is not the answer to everything. Nicolaides is a very, very flawed book. I have acknowledged this from the first time I ever mentioned his name. <laughs> uh... But I also think it has got some of the best stuff in it for the training of artists for what's important. So it's a difficult, it's a difficult course. People gave their opinions and it kind of got tiresome to me. Just stay away from Nicolaides. And oh, you know, it's the gospel of everything. Uh, it... It tends to be training that if you are way over on the tight side, you could really use that gesture stuff. And if you are way over on the loose side, you could really use those right angle studies. And you can do right angle studies from Edward Mybridge's figures because he's got the human figure in motion from the 1870s and he shot those things on one axis and on a 90 degree axis and sometimes even another 90 degree axis and you can take one of those pictures and see, figure out what would it look like if I were looking at it from another position and then you've got the answer there after you've struggled with it. Now that's slow motion and that's one of the most valuable things you'll get from Nicolaides is that you train in two opposite ways, meticulous and expressive. Now, one of these days, if we, if we can't, I'll tell you what, if we do a Bridgman, we are going to do a Bridgman course. We may subtitle this Bridgman course, Figure Drawing Lessons from George Bridgman with a dose of Nicolaides in it. Okay. And that way we can answer all those questions. Don't promise and, that. And, what? What? Don't promise that. Yeah, well, are you actually planning on doing that? I think so. Did you just come up with that? No, I've been thinking that. Okay. And let me tell you why. They both taught at the same place, Art Students League, so? at the same time. <laughs> okay. And Nicolaides deferred to George Bridgman for certain bits of information that he wasn't teaching. So the two would balance each other out very well. And the two also have this stature in history of training a lot of remarkable artists. So why not? Why not? balance Bridgman out with a dose of lessons from Nicolaides. I'm willing to take it on. I like doing that. 
I think to go through Nicolaides information and Bridgman's information and see how they could correlate. Hey, Stan and Marshall, this is Wes Douglas from Glen Ellen, Illinois, a suburb of Chicago. I'm a big fan of your podcast, really like it, and um, I have a question for you. I noticed there seems to be a resurgence in the use of ballpoint pen to create high-quality, almost etching-like sketches. Some are even very photographic in nature. Um, my questions for you um, are, do you feel that the ballpoint is a serious, viable art tool? And two, if, if so, what are your favorite techniques that you've seen? Uh, I noticed there's some artists uh, like Francis Van Stone um, or Samuel Silva. Um, there's also a military artist named Richard Johnson who uh, uses ballpoint to great effect. And I wanted to know your opinion of the ballpoint as an art tool. Thank you. I'll wait for the podcast answer. Thanks. Bye. Stan, you want to start? Wes, I'm sorry. This might be a little rude, and I apologize in advance. But come on. <laughs> come on, man. Is is ballpoint a viable tool? It's been <laughs> Why wouldn't it be? I don't get it. Does it make a line? It does. It and what do you mean a resurgence? Like people people have been using it for a while now. Comic books have been around, you know. I, I don't remember them going away. I've I've had a ballpoint pen since I was little. <laughs> it's it's like asking is yellow still a popular color? Should I actually put it on my palette? Like yes, it is. Um, it depends on how you use it. it it's not about it if does. ballpoint pen is good or not. If it ever was good, then it's still good. It, it's yeah. Uh, I don't know. I'm sorry. Well, I'm sorry. That was rude. Stan is under a lot of stress. He's got a small child in the house, and sometimes he's not responsible for his actions. What? I'd like to just say that I loved the ballpoint pen as a teenager. I loved it, but what I found out is that it faded like crazy, and so I turned my back on it, never to use it again, but I missed the grip and the texture and that sense of oil coming out of that hard tip. It was just a great tool. And then later on, they started to make less fugitive ballpoint pens, and I haven't paid much attention to it. But if you love what it does, and you look at the people who are doing it well, and you pursue it, who cares? Whether it's fugitive or not, you can scan it at 1200 DPI and you can get great effects. Yeah, it doesn't have to last forever. I mean, digital, you don't, even with digital, you don't have a, a like a, an original copy of something, right? So, yeah. if you, if you can get an effect with ballpoint pen that you just can't with something else and you really enjoy it, yeah, go ahead and scan it and there it is. Yeah, and fugitive, by the way, if you don't know, means that it fades. So there's sunlight, sunlight, or, or light runes. Do all of them fade? Are, are there any ballpoint pens that don't fade? Do they make archival ones? There used to be no ballpoint pens that didn't that didn't fade, but uh, they came in with some in the in the eighties that were really bad, but at least they were permanent. Nah, well, I don't know. It doesn't matter though. It doesn't matter if you choose an unpopular instrument. There's a there's a, a band. A, a punk band that's entirely acoustic instruments. They play a banjo and a and a and a washboard street street punk band. And it, it's, that's not what you play punk rock with. Yeah, well, in their hands. And you know, Weird Al Yankovic took the most uncool instrument that you could use, an accordion. In fact, that that punk band uses an accordion, uh, and uh, made it so that it was it was cool. You choose the instrument you love. As much as anything else, because you love it, not because it's a viable instrument. Who would, who's to say? What if I was to say, no, uh, ballpoint pen is not a viable instrument, and then Stan were to say, it's true, it's not a viable. Well, would you, would you quit? <laughs> yeah, we should. We should just like randomly. At the, we should create a new segment: tools that are no longer cool, uncool tools. Yeah, do not use these. And just come up with a new one. Like this week, this is uncool. Nobody can use this. And then you prove yourself the rebel. They yeah. said it was uncool and therefore I'm going to prove them wrong. 
And then we get this wonderful fighting dynamic goes yeah. on that strengthens you. Yeah. And you can humiliate us. We should play the clip of Kim jong Gi looking at the audience. What kind of pen do you use? Gives them the stink eye. Anyway, thanks for your question, Wes. Yeah, thank you. And I'm sorry. <laughs> uh, that was the last question. You want to start a an intellectual argument that turns into just pure insults then? Right now? Yeah. Why? To give people something to enjoy. I just argued with one of our listeners. Is that not good enough for you? Uh, that's not good enough for me. It's a start. It shows that you got the spirit right. You got the energy. I'm in a fighting mode, but it's not fighting with me. Well, I think it's one up that. It's fighting with our audience. Yeah, you're right. It's tackier. That's it's, for sure. Damn it, Marshall. <laughs> <laughs> Come on, can you, why don't you insult one of our listeners? People call him with sincere questions and Stan is right there to say, come on. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I already apologized. What? Come on, Marshall. Give me, you have to, what, did you learn anything from Jesus? <laughs> I'm, I'm trying to. I'm trying to. I think this is a time to have a conversation about this. About Jesus? That's what, that's what our next podcast will be. About Jesus. Art lessons from Jesus. Oh my God. I think so. Marshall with the empty promises. I know that some people wouldn't like it, but I would take it on to go through all the teachings and see which ones apply to artists. I bet you you'd find wisdom in it. Probably. Ah, oh, jeez. You, you have so many empty promises at the end of these episodes. Well, I figure, you know, it's sort of a, it sort of keeps it going. It's a cliffhanger that they fall off at the end. Let us slice this misery off at the very spinal cord. Yeah, Marshall. Amputations save lives. Yeah, let's do it. Let's amputate right now. The end cut. <laughs>